what is going to be discussed in this talk? First of all, I'm going to talk about the Brownswords concepts of laws 1.0 to 3.0. We did rip the name straight from Web 1.0 to 3.0, uh, and that's basically to set a bedrock layer on how the law tries to adapt digital assets and the internet as a whole. Uh, I'll, I'll try to quickly go through that to give everyone context. Uh, the second part of the talk will be specifically talking about two of four of the main legal issues with. Uh, Web 3.0, really, uh, using NFTs as an example. And then the third one, uh, I'll, I'll talk about more of the trends as to where the law might be heading or could head in the future to make it more secure for everyone using this technology. Uh, this third section will be a lot more open if you want it, if anyone's got any ideas, obviously you guys are more experts in this field when it comes to technology uh, and when it comes to law, especially speculating about the future of law, we genuinely believe that there are no stupid questions and there are no idiotic ideas. Literally everything can be argued if you've got a basis for it. So, to start off, Law 1.0. This is your traditional, basic, standard law that has been operating since the beginning of human society. Uh, it is what governs your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, you probably uh, have already been applying Law 1.0 throughout your life, even just getting here. Uh, don't go over the speed limit. Uh, pay a fare on public transport. Hopefully don't kill anybody. Uh, you know, everybody knows what Law 1.0 is. But, Law 1.0 had to change when the digital revolution happened. And the digital revolution is, um, if, if you don't know, it's an idea that was sort of described as happening somewhere around 1995. Uh, and it's basically when the law had to realise what cyberspace was. The internet was becoming more and more common in public and professional usage. Uh, so, uh, clearly the law had to deal with this completely new scenario. Uh, so, a lot of philosophical legal debates started cropping up uh, as to how we should treat uh, cyberspace. You know, is it a jurisdiction of its own, uh, independent from the physical jurisdiction? If so, what laws should apply to cyberspace? Should it have its own laws? Should it have no laws whatsoever? If we start applying our own jurisdiction's laws to cyberspace, what's stopping someone from your jurisdiction, you know, committing a crime, which is legal where you are physically, but a crime somewhere else in the world, which is also using cyberspace? So, because these are all very difficult questions to answer, uh, what lawmakers decided to do is basically set up a big fat wall around cyberspace. Uh, we decided to cut it off, uh, metaphorically, uh, and uh, wait <laughs> a few decades until we figured out an answer. And this is where, well, to carry on this metaphor uh, of the wall, lawmakers interpret cyberspace as being a sort of new continent. It's a totally independent new jurisdiction which somehow borders every single country in the world. And cyberspace is then colonised, so to speak, by uh, independent uh, individuals, or private individuals, uh, and businesses uh, who carve up territories, territories of cyberspace, which we call websites, uh, that allow us in the physical jurisdiction access so that we can experience cyberspace for ourselves. And this is where Law 2.0 comes in. So, Law 1.0 can be interpreted, you know, for new things that are coming in. Uh, we can reinterpret, we can apply law, uh, sort of look at the spirit of what was said at the time and try to extrapolate how new scenarios are dealt with. But 
this is kind of hard when it comes to more rigid aspects of law. So, for example, in the turning of uh, the 20th century in the UK, uh, it took uh, legislators in the UK, uh, the time it took for the average speed of cars to double by the time uh, legislation was passed to increase the speed limit. Basically just because in the late 1800s, lawmakers of the day couldn't comprehend cars going any faster than 12 miles per hour. So we're applying a system of laws that were developed in say the early 90s and prior to the situation of right here, right now in the digital world, which who could have predicted where we are right now back then? unless you were writing a science fiction novel, basically. So Law 2.0 tries to create a sort of middleman system where there's a concept of intermediary and platform regulation, or IPR. Uh, this is where we respect that private individuals and companies are the ones uh, you know, colonizing cyberspace. They're the ones allowing us access to cyberspace. They're probably going to be the experts on cyberspace. So what we do is we take the companies in the physical world and we apply our laws onto them so that they apply vaguely the law onto their segment of cyberspace. But anything that isn't touched on by our laws, our law 1.0, they're allowed to self-regulate. They're allowed to do whatever they want. And a good example of this is, you know, uh, for example, the, uh, the Capitol Hill riots in America, uh, what was it, last year, the year before, um, where Trump and many Trump supporters were banned off of Facebook and Twitter. No law in the real world allowed them to do it. It was purely under self-regulation. And they've now set up their own internal cyber courts, which allow them to, you know, completely decide what these laws are within their own territories. So, yeah, to explain how this middleman system works as well, just from another angle, if, say you're on Facebook, if you find the legal content on Facebook, uh, which, you know, is clearly illegal, like it's, uh, 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 porn being angled to six-year-olds or something. If you report that to Facebook, Facebook has a duty under IPR to deal with that. Uh, completely ban that user, remove the content, no matter what it is, just deal with it. But if they knowingly harbour illegal content without doing anything, our physical jurisdictions can then take legal action against the physical companies. So it is this sort of, so long as you make sure that nobody's doing anything illegal, we'll turn our backs and make sure, or well, we'll just allow you to do whatever you want. But then issues started to arise from this system very quickly um, with the rise of the second digital revolution. Uh, which is believed to be roughly in around the 2010s, uh, and it was the rise of social media and the rise of the information economy. If you don't know what the information economy is, it's basically uh, when we travel uh, these territories of cyberspace, uh, there is a, essentially a tax levied on us, where the people who own the websites, the companies, will harvest a portion of our data so that they can sell it on to other companies. Now, Law 1.0 didn't know how to deal with this. So Law 2.0 also didn't know how to deal with this. It therefore came under self-regulation. You know, that meant that these companies who were profiting the most from this information economy were the ones in charge of this information economy. And of course, these companies became insanely rich because of it. You know, look at the big five uh, web-based companies in the world today. Quite a lot of them are either purely social media or have social media aspects to them. 
And it all started from the second digital revolution and the, the money cow of, you know, this fully untapped, free, unregulated market that they could just do whatever they wanted with. So uh, I've also got a quote here, uh, which is from uh, everyone's favourite uh, ex-health uh, minister, Matt Hancock, before he was health minister, where he described this situation of, uh, of the internet as a Wild West free for all. And you know, he was right, to be fair. So this is where Law 3.0 comes in. And Law 3.0 is the proposed complete harmonisation of law and technology, uh, where you, you're not capable of doing anything illegal because there are already systems built into what you are doing to prevent something which under every circumstance is illegal. A good example of this is trains. Uh, before, health and safety law uh, said that a driver couldn't unlock and open the doors until the train had come to a full standstill. Well, now the law has completely integrated into the technology so that, you know, under most general circumstances, the door <coughs> will not open at all until the train has physically come to a standstill. Yeah. So, loss of can't go in cyberspace, in the digital environment, it's the proposed idea of taking the self-regulating power away from these private bodies and individuals and uh, applying the law directly onto cyberspace. The first successful implementation of Law 3.0 uh, is arguably the EU's GDPR, as we all know. Uh, it imposed regulation on the information economy itself. Uh, it set boundaries for companies operating in this system, uh, and I, I like to refer to this as cyber capitalism, where it's basically a digital market, uh, Quote, uh, a digital market controlled by private bodies subject to limited state-imposed regulations. The information economy from this point onwards was supposed to comply completely with uh, these sets of regulations and standards to best safeguard the well-being of the, the everyday user, us. When we access the internet and we have our data harvested, we now have the option to say no, or we have the option to understand what data is being taken from us, and we can consent to different levels of it. So that is law 2.5, where we are right now. Most aspects of the internet are still self-regulated. You know, the, the recent example of uh, the Trump supporters being back on Facebook and Twitter. But there is still a lot of regulation being you know, increasingly implemented, especially to do with cyber capitalism. And there is a system of harmonization as well, which gets around the initial arguments of, well, whose jurisdiction's laws apply to cyberspace then. Because the GDPR sets up a system where cyber capitalism only really operates in the EU. But then if you are a company which is based outside of the EU, but want to tap into that market, because there's a lot of people who access the internet in the EU, you're going to want to access that uh, market. GDPR says that if you do, you need to comply with these rules as well. This then influences the, uh, the countries and jurisdictions that these companies are based in to then also change their laws and comply essentially with GDPR, even if it's not officially compliant with GDPR. And then therefore, you know, these companies, uh, say with the UK for example, we are not part of the EU anymore, but our legislation is still harmonised with GDPR. We haven't changed the legislation since, you know, leaving the EU. So it's still basically the, exactly the same. Even though we're not in the EU, any company that then wants to access us as a market and take our data when we're using the internet, they also need to comply with uh, cyber capitalism. So it is this sort of spreading uh, harmonization effect, really. And well, yeah, that is basically how the law treats cyberspace. So, section two NFTs. 
What are they? If you don't know already, NFT stands for non-fungible token. Token meaning it is a piece of code on a blockchain which represents uh, a, well it's a completely unique, one-of-kind code on a blockchain which represents a digital asset. Uh, so that's why I've got this uh, lovely thumbs up and down representation uh, because when we talk about NFTs there's a lot of conflation between what is defined as an NFT. The actual image itself, legally and literally, is not an NFT. That is a digital asset. The NFT itself is the token, it is the bit of code that you access, which then permits you access to using and acquiring and viewing the digital asset, whether it's a, an image or a GIF or you know, whatever. Uh, and the, the theoretical appeal of NFTs is... Uh, the example that's often used is uh, with oil paintings. You know, you've, you've got an oil painting, uh, you can either buy that specific original piece of art made by the artist, or you can buy a print of it. And the argument with NFTs is when you buy an NFT, uh, you are basically uh, gaining ownership of the oil painting. And anyone else who copies it or screenshots it, I will get onto it, is merely uh, getting a print of that piece of art. Why is the law an issue on this? Well, in short, the, the law is really made uh, to protect scientists, to protect society. And this, of course, extends into keeping the best interests of everyone you know, kept, or at least the most amount of people. The NFT market is worth billions of dollars. Uh, the most expensive NFT being sold, uh, I still believe, is this one on the left. Uh, the big one, the collage. Uh, where it was valued and sold at nearly 70 million dollars. That's a lot even just for a physical asset, but then we've got, it's a digital asset, and we've got the issues of laws 1.0 to 3.0 trying to consider on top of the stresses of having to protect something that valuable. Uh, another example is uh, the other one, uh, the, the other image here, the card. Uh, it's subject to a very recent legal case, which has only just started, uh, so, of course, we don't have a lot of details open to the public, but basically what happened was uh, Matt Fury, who uh, is the uh, original artist of Pick and Frog, uh, decided to create an NFT series where uh, this image was sold as a unique, limited edition, one of a kind, uh, and it was sold for around $500,000. Two weeks later, uh, on the same blockchain, he released 46 identical versions of this asset for free to just random people who didn't buy it. So, of course, the person who paid $500,000 for this image is taking Mr. Fury to court. Uh, what will actually happen uh, from this legal case? No one actually knows because the law is so undefined when it comes to digital assets and NFTs. It literally could swing in favour of either way. We, we cannot predict right now. So if you're interested, that's probably a story to keep in mind, but legal cases do take years to complete. So whether you can keep your attention span up for that long is up to debate. Um, now I need to start talking about property rights because it's very important when it comes to digital assets. Uh, in Scots law, we define property as having two properties. Uh, it's movableness and it's corporealness. Uh, well, corporeal meaning physicalness. Uh, so basically, heritable and movable is uh, whether you can move it or can't move it. Uh, and corporeal and incorporeal, uh, is it physical, is it real? Uh, can you touch it and put it in your pocket or not? Uh, these distinctions 
allow us to separate out ownership and property rights. Uh, so the ownership right completely different to the rights you get when you own an incorporeal movable property. So understanding what kind of what kind of property something is, is very important for the law if it's not defined already in a bit of legislation. So the first issue when it comes to NFTs is theft. When someone screenshots an NFT, one of the common arguments against it is to claim ownership through the blockchain uh, and accuse the other person of stealing their property. Um, now, theft in Scots law, and I realise I will be talking about Scots law purely because I am a Scots law student, uh, but I, I, I clarify I do learn about uh, UK wide law, EU law, some aspects of international law, and everything that I talk about, uh, while the definitions might be purely in Scots law, the overall spirit of the law is basically concurrent at least to the entirety of Europe. Normally it's internationally, but there's little bits here and there that's different. So theft in Scots law is a common law crime. That means there isn't actually one definition of it. There is multiple rules that have been built up over cases. So every time a judge decides something new about a theft case, that is ticked on as part of the definition of theft. Uh, this here is a quote that I've taken from uh, one of my textbooks, and I believe it uh, uh, really sort of encapsulates all of the rules uh, in together. Uh, so, the taking and or appropriating of property belonging to another without their consent, with the intention to deprive them of its use. One thing this definition does miss out, though, is the shared belief across pretty much every legal system that property must be corporeal and movable for it to be stolen. For theft to occur, you need to be able to pick it up, pocket it, and move it away from the place it was put down by the owner of the property. And of course, the first issue here when it comes to NFTs uh, is clearly corporealness. Are NFTs corporeal? Uh, no, they're not. Digital is the antithesis of physical. Uh, it is a piece of code. Uh, you cannot pick this piece of code up, you cannot pocket it, you cannot walk away with it. Therefore, it isn't a physical corporeal asset, it cannot be legally stolen under any jurisdiction. But say the law changes though, and digital assets start being treated as though they are physical, I will get onto that line of argument later, because there is a chance that in 10 years we will have exceptions to the rule when it comes to theft. We would then have to think about deprivation. Now, if you watch any crime drama or uh, courtroom drama, you'll probably recognise the phrases actus reus in mens rea. It's basically the idea that for a crime to have happened, uh, you need uh, the, the, the action of a crime and the intentions to commit the crime. So the action for theft is purely just the deprivation. It doesn't matter whether the thief benefits from the asset or not. All that matters is that the owner of the property and, um, doesn't have it anymore or can't benefit from its use specifically. So here in the corner we have a rather famous NFT uh, which is part of the Boarding Yacht Club collection uh, and if you don't recognise it, this specific piece is owned by a talk show host, Jimmy Fallon. Uh, he, he does what a lot of uh, so-called crypto bros uh, do, where they put their uh, either most expensive or favourite uh, NFT as their crypto profile picture. But what's stopping you from, say, uh, screenshotting uh, Mr Fallon's uh, NFT and sacrificing the dignity of your new Twitter profile 
uh, and applying it as your own profile picture. Uh, <laughs> am I depriving Mr. Fallon from his property here? You, you can check on Twitter right now, and you can see for yourselves whether both of us, either of us, are depriving one another from using this image, or benefiting from his property. At that again, that's probably a better way to describe it. Am I preventing Fallon from benefiting from his ownership of that NFT? No, not really. Could you not argue that the fact that he's now sharing it with some Scots Law student or someone famous is actually reduced his benefit? You could certainly argue that it's reduced its benefit, yes, but would that come under uh, would that come under stealing it? Oh yeah, carry on. Well the world with copyright laws. Copyright laws. Smart man. Two slides later, I'm getting on to copyright. <laughs> um, any, any other questions before we move on? No? Okay. Uh, right, what about Sally? Sorry, I do have a script here just to prepare my new plan. Um, yes, I'm sorry. This is a general issue with Web 3.0 when it comes to theft or taking of digital assets without permission. What if I stole Fallon's wallet that the NFT, the, the literal NFT, is on a bit of code? What if someone here hacked into his account and then sold his NFT for tuppence on the blockchain to yourselves? Well, you would think that maybe that is theft at that point. That, you know, maybe it's cut and dry. But current legal interpretation doesn't actually allow that. It still isn't theft. You've got loads of cases in America, the UK, all across the EU of people stealing one another's cryptocurrencies, which are also digital assets on the blockchain. It's just they're not non fungible. Uh, and not a single one of them has been charged with theft, or at least successfully charged with theft. It often comes under some other uh, economic crime, like extortion or what have you. But that is a totally different field of law. So then, we come to the second issue. Intellectual <laughs> property and copyright law. Uh, copyright is the protection of expression. Intellectual property uh, is creative ideas that copyright law recognises as your creations and therefore gives you rights of ownership over it. Uh, these rights are protective and they prevent anyone from using, adapting, uh, selling your creative property without it being considered an infringement and you can take legal action against them. So this relates back to the property rights I explained earlier. Uh, IP is incorporeal movable property. That means it cannot be stolen, but you do get certain different other rights associated, which means no one can use it without you know, your permission. Uh, or you know, you've got a system in place where if someone does use it, uh, they need to pay royalties. For example, they don't need to consistently ask the person who owns copyright, uh, you know, whether they can get permission. They just pay a little fee, and then you can use it. Explain how it isn't theft and the differences between incorporeal and corporeal uh, movable rights uh, is uh, with a lot of business espionage cases. Uh, where you can, uh, uh, yes, you will have a lot of employees uh, who steal trade secrets, or steal trade secrets, uh, and then try to sell it on to a rival company. Every single time this happens, it doesn't come under theft. Well, yes, they might have stolen some office paper, uh, but they can't steal the information held on the paper. Instead, they are attempting to infringe the copyright 
of the uh, of their employer, basically. So when it comes to digital copyright, there is a bit of a struggle here because, on average, when it comes to any competition between the digital world, cyberspace, and the physical world, copyright will and will and legal systems in general will prefer the physical world in what we do rather than anything online. A good example is uh, the Assassin's Creed franchise is uh, pretty famous for uh, you know, pretty accurately depicting uh, places in our history uh, pretty accurately as to how they would have been back then. Uh, and uh, a big gripe in uh, the historic community is the Cathedral of Notre Dame in uh, Assassin's Creed Unity, which is set in, I believe, revolutionary France. Uh, and the issue here is because that isn't Notre Dame. It might look like it if you don't live there all the time and see it all the time, but it isn't Notre Dame because there is copyright over Notre Dame that the French government owns as a protected historic building. And Ubisoft couldn't, or didn't want to pay the inordinate uh, royalties to gain access to Notre Dame. So they tried to stitch together this Frankenstein's version of Notre Dame while skirting the edges of copyright infringement. And this is where we get into the issue of NFTs again. The only reason IP rights are conveyed to someone is because legislation is in place uh, to prove where copyright does and doesn't carry over. No legislation currently talks about NFTs or blockchain. It is completely blank on the matter. And that carries with it the issue, uh, oh sorry, that carries with it the issue of uh, Yes, NFTs only actually have the most basic of ownership rights. That you can use it, you can sell it, you can destroy it, that's it. You don't actually own the copyright over it, even if you have bought the NFT related to a digital asset. And that's because we need to look at the definition of an NFT again. You have the ownership rights over a bit of code. You don't have the ownership rights over the asset that the code is related to. If anyone was to try and apply copyright, it would go to the original artist of the piece because no legislation is in place to guarantee that these full copyright IP ownership rights pass on to the person who owns it. It's a bit like, uh, a bit like how CDs... Uh, it's a bit like how CDs are... Uh, I'll, uh, I'll skip that bit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, okay, right. When you're talking about art and the comparison of oil paintings being related to uh, NFTs, that you're buying an NFT, therefore you're buying an, uh, an oil painting, what it actually is in practice is uh, an artist made an oil painting uh, and they set up a unique limited edition print of that oil painting, which then you buy. That is how the law treats NFTs. So that still allows the artist to make their own copies if we go to the Matt Fury case back again. Uh, and it means that you know, the person who bought the NFT doesn't necessarily uh, have access to change it or adapt it themselves. Uh, and I will change them all. I will quick fire these. Uh, <laughs> flexibility of the law uh, relates to uh, electricity here. Electricity is not corporeal, it is not physical, you cannot touch it, pick it up and put it in your pocket. Except, Law 1.0 has reinterpreted electricity to be stolen. If you tamper with a meter, you're stealing electricity, it's theft that you will be accused of. Uh, and then <laughs> we'll get to RuneScape, who would have thought RuneScape is actively changing the law of the world. Uh, there was a case in the Netherlands where uh, a, a runescaper uh, had a mask and an amulet stolen, well, forcibly removed from them by two runescapists. And this came to uh, the Dutch courts. 
This went all the way to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court ruled at the time and effort that uh, this little boy, this little moonscaper, had put in to acquiring these assets, gave it the same amount of rights as a physical asset. So if you put the work in, a digital asset could become exactly the same as a physical asset in terms of rights. Uh, other real world applications are uh, the suggestion of linking uh, physical assets with NFTs as well. Uh, Nike uh, set up uh, CryptoKicks, which is still in development at the moment, but they, they do have copyright over the name. Uh, and the idea is that you could be able to buy an NFT of a unique design and then have that unique design printed as a shoe. Uh, and there's also the, 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 the other idea that if you have two unique designs on the blockchain, you can combine them together to create your own Nike CryptoKicks. NFT and then have that either you know physically made into a product or you could sell that for yourself. Uh, and that is sort of getting around the issue of copyright not inherently passing to the person who owns it uh, because Nike are implementing what is called uh, smart royalties which are still a bit grey at the moment um, and what a smart royalty is is if Embedded into the code of the NFT itself, every time that is sold on again, a percentage of that sale goes back to the original person who minted the NFT. Uh, and then we, we also have, uh, related to the Ukrainian war at the moment, uh, Ukraine has set up uh, a meta-history museum uh, where they are preserving their history and art uh, on the blockchain. And you can buy it uh, and all proceeds go to the preservation of the Ukrainian state. And this also brings up the questions of how can we use NFTs to preserve art which might not be around for a while, such and how, how can we support these industries, such as street art, where street art is often done, you know, uh, you make a bit of street art, it's gone by the weekend, uh, and these people make amazing pieces of art without a penny being given to them. Uh, and how do we, you know? work around that. Uh, and I do apologise for rushing that last section, I could ramble a bit. If anyone's got any questions or suggestions or anything, you can try it now. Yeah, carry on. What if you have like something like an NFT on a USB drive, right? On like a physical wallet, mm -hmm. and that gets stolen. Mm -hmm. What's the evaluation of that stolen good will be? So is it going to be the value of the actual USB or uh, like how, how the content of the code inside is going to be wide because I don't think there are any official evaluators of the NFT price. That's true. Um, yeah. Uh, well, firstly, it would depend what cryptocurrency is on it, whether it is respected in the jurisdiction that it's stolen in. Uh, some jurisdictions have outright banned cryptocurrencies, so that would have a value of zero dollars. Uh, while, uh, say, Ethereum is accepted to uh, be traded, uh, Bitcoin is legal tender in some places, so they gain full rights of currency. But there could be an argument that that would come under the uh, the same interpretation as business espionage cases, where you've got the actual incorporeal information uh, printed on a piece of paper. If you steal this, literally you've only stolen the piece of paper. The information inside it technically hasn't been stolen because it's not corporeal in nature. Uh, but I don't know of any cases that are specifically like that. There could be some which prove me wrong uh, because it is you know, a lot of interpretation, uh, but that would be my initial reaction uh, to how that would go. Uh, anything else? Oh, <laughs> Since the NFTs are available globally, mm -hmm. under uh, which country's law is the crime going to be like? Yeah, if, 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 for example, your NFT gets stolen, can you, uh, you live in the UK, can you apply to the court in Spain? Uh, it would depend where it is stolen and uh, the laws of where the thief is at the moment. So, Scots law is currently an adoption where if something is stolen uh, anywhere and then the thief comes to Scotland, uh, Scotland will prosecute the act of theft under their law rather than the jurisdiction that was actually stolen in, which 
is fairly unique, uh, but it, it all depends on the laws of the jurisdiction. Uh, when it comes to uh, banning uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, a lot of Web 3.0 entirely, uh, Islamic law is the third largest legal system behind civil and common law, uh, and uh, because it is uh, highly influenced by the religion of Islam, uh, there is a lot of restrictions or bans on speculative trading, which cryptocurrencies and NFTs are basically a game of hot potato to see who can you know, make the most money. It's not a very certain uh, currency or way of trading, so a lot of Islamic countries have outright banned uh, cryptocurrencies from legally being used in their country, or even if they are being used, uh, their value is nothing. So, uh, I think that answers your question. Yeah, okay, so technically, uh, finding the location of the uh, of the mm. is the uh, the victim must do it. Sorry, what was that? The victim must find the location of the thief. Uh, yeah, it depends on the jurisdiction of where it was stolen uh, and where the thief is. Uh, if you don't know where the thief is, then you know, arguably, who can you convict at that point? It would go under investigation. Uh, when it comes to international law, there are harmonised aspects, but when it comes to crimes, especially digital crimes, uh, the law is still catching up, really. Uh, we're almost there when it comes to cybercrime, uh, but say like the, the UK's cybercrime legislation is quite outdated and it, it needs reforming, um, but other countries are more up to date. So. That's all the lunch time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.